why is AMD overwhelming us with choice? There's so many confusing options that are on different levels of technology. I, I, I want the latest technology, always, right? Well, not necessarily. This is the Pro WS WRX80 SE Sage Wi-Fi. That's, well, that's kind of a mouthful. This is for Threadripper Pro. This is the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Alpha. Also a mouthful, but for Threadripper, not pro. And both of these, right now today, you can get Zen 2 based processors for them. This is the uh, consumer enthusiast platform. This is the I gotta get stuff done work platform. This supports unbuffered error correcting memory and non error correcting memory. This works ideally with registered error correcting memory. You know, because the, uh, the processor socket is turned one way or the other. The, the processor sockets may look the same, but they're not compatible. Just depends on what you want to do. To make matters more complicated, potentially more confusing, AMD just launched Milan 3rd Gen Epic. Those are based on Zen 3 cores. And depending on what you're doing, you could see a 9 to like 25, 30% plus uplift. I mean, it's 19% IPC plus, uh, you know, you get a little bit of a frequency bump. So depending on what you're doing, you could see a substantial increase in performance overall, depending on what your workload is. So does it make sense to do Epic as a workstation? Well, I've got the relatively pedestrian S8030 from Tyann. I don't think it makes sense to use Epic as a workstation as long as the boards available are roughly like the uh, the Tyann motherboard here, but it's actually even a little more complicated than that. Let's dive in. All right, so I've done a lot of Threadripper workstation builds. Water-cooled, not water-cooled, using Noctua Tower Cooler, using the uh, unfortunately not very reliable Intermax Lictech all-in-ones. Uh, they're not bad if you redo the fluid in them. I've done videos on that. So I don't really feel the need to super talk about the Threadripper platform. It really is a question of Zen 2 or Zen 3. Zen 2 or Zen 3. And uh, I thought it would be fun to look at the motherboards side by side so you know what features you're getting. There are some things in common between these two motherboards. The Tyann S8030 and the Asus Pro WS WRX80 have built-in 10 gigabit Intel Ethernet. Well, depending on what version you get, you might only get built-in one gig. They both have IPMI, which is for remote management. You can basically log into your computer when it's off. That means they've got onboard VGA. Now, the WRX80E Sage has a VGA breakout header because they know that, you know, that back rear panel I.O. Uh, area is the uh, maybe something you shouldn't use your VGA connection for because nobody's actually going to use that Whereas on the Tyann motherboard, it's built in it's on the IO backplate speaking of IO backplate That's where you should look to determine the main differences between these two motherboards. This is a desktop motherboard. You're gonna use it like a desktop Computer you're gonna use it as a workstation. The server motherboard has basically no rear IO You've got your network connection. You got that VGA connection you got a couple of USB ports. That's it, nothing else. The Sage SE Wi-Fi has built-in Wi-Fi and a total of 10 rear USB ports and seven front USB ports. So that's hugely different. You can actually use it like a workstation, otherwise you're gonna need a hub or gonna need to use one of your expansion slots. This is another thing that may seem paradoxical. The WRX80 has seven expansion slots, seven. Well, on the WRX platform with Threadripper Pro, you get all 128 PCI Express lanes. And that's also true on the server platform with Epic, you get 128 PCI Express lane, uh, directly distributed. And that kind of hints about our next major difference. This has a chipset for IO. The server platform doesn't. There's not really a chipset. WRX, in this case, is the chipset. We talk about, you know, even desktop boards that have AM4. The CPU is connected to another chip that manages peripheral I.O. because on a desktop, most of your peripherals are slow. The CPU is the fast thing. In a server, that's not necessarily true. In a server, it could be a little bit of a bottleneck passing all of your peripherals through a chipset. WRX gives you both. Seven slots, 
plus a chipset. So no matter what you're doing, you're covered. So I think all of these things make a server type Epic platform. I mean, I'm not picking on Tyann. It just makes a server type platform super unattractive for a desktop class experience because you're gonna have to claw all those things back in with add-in peripherals and then you'll run into little compatibility issues and little qualification issues. That's what you're paying Asus for. Asus in this board, they've put USB controllers on here. They've done the connection. They've done, they've done the routing. They've done the power distribution to make sure that everything is working as it should. And so I think that uh, until there are workstation class motherboards for Epic, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to try to use Epic as a workstation platform. Now, I don't know if AMD's grand vision is to replace Threadripper with Threadripper Pro pretty much across the board. Because if I had a choice between Threadripper and Threadripper Pro, I think I'm gonna lean a little bit toward Threadripper Pro. And if we look at Epic pricing, Epic Milan, those P-series CPUs, which are CPUs that are designed to work in single socket systems, they've got a 24 core CPU that is a P-series CPU, and it costs leet dollars, one, three, three, seven dollars. That's the, uh, the tray price, I guess, or the, the bulk volume price, the recommended price. And so, uh, 1337 for Zen 3 cores, $1,300 for, for 24 Zen 3 cores, that's pretty good. I mean, if we look at Threadripper, not Pro, pricing, 32 cores for $2,000 and, and on up. Now the, now the P-Series Milan CPU is like $24, $2,500, somewhere in that range. So it's a little bit more expensive than the 32 core Threadripper. Threadripper Pro is a little harder for system integrators to deal with because they've got more complex routing as far as memory goes because it's eight channels of memory, not four channels of memory on the regular Threadripper platform. Both of these platforms, the Epic server and the WRX, that's eight memory channels. So there's, there's you know, feature parity there. One really cool thing about the WRX80 is that it does support unbuffered and buffered memory. Registered memory, unregistered memory, error correcting memory, not error correcting memory. WRX don't care, because it works. A TRX40 twerks. So based on this pricing and market conditions, it sure looks like AMD could get away with, you know, if it's possible, I don't even know if it's possible, seems like it might be, to enable, you know, Epic compatibility with the WRX platform. That would be pretty cool. But if Threadripper Pro is needed because the memory compatibility isn't exactly the same across the board, I mean, this, you know, like I say, this supports unbuffered memory and, and non-error correcting memory, whereas I don't think you can get away with that, at least on the Epic motherboards that I've tried, no post. So, and it might have actually damaged one of the DIMMs that I tested, but it was older. It was 2133. It uh, was a reference DIMM, so it's probably fine. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't get post on uh, two different Epic server motherboards that I tried when I was using non-error correcting memory. Um, would I like to see Epic support in something like this? Well, yeah, heck yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, the pricing sort of gets interesting because I don't think the pricing can get a lot better. Like if you look at the P-series CPUs, you know, $1,300-ish for a 24-core Epic CPU. It's pretty good. I mean, it's basically on par with last gen's, you know, Zen 2 Threadripper. Uh, and Threadripper Pro is a little bit more expensive. But when the new Threadripper Pro comes out, hypothetically, based on Zen 3, or something based on Zen 3, then that could be a thing. Now, here's the other interesting thing this launch with Milan. Andy's launching with a lot more SKUs. Is that because they've been wildly successful with Rome? Which, make no mistake, they definitely have been. Rome is market leading in pretty much everything. And Milan only seals the deal because there were certain workloads with Rome where uh, it was at parity or a little bit worse than other options available in the market. But now Milan pretty much leads in just about any workload. We're gonna have to see how the uh, market responds to that and what new products are produced to sort of fill the gap or how those products you know, come about. But again, looking at the pricing and the distribution, you know, will we see a Threadripper CPU that has a lot more wattage? That was a differentiator early on. Now, we've got the CPUs like the 75F3, which are basically at the upper end, you know, 280 watts. Does that mean that we would see a 300 watt or a 320 watt Threadripper? I don't, I don't know, maybe. I mean, stuff like that is pretty much the only thing that should really drive um, segmentation between the Pro platform 
and the non-pro platform. Me personally, I'd love to see them just unlock the WRX80 platform for Epic, if that's possible, if that's electrically a safe thing to do. Maybe it's just a matter of qualification. I don't know. But if it means that Threadripper is going to stick around and it's gonna be at basically the same price point and uh, it's going to have some differentiating features like more TDP, okay, cool, I welcome that. I can wait a little bit for that. You know, when Epic Rome launched, I got a little impatient then too. I took an Epic Rome 24 core CPU, threw it in a server motherboard and we did that. We added the peripherals necessary to uh, make that work on a gigabyte motherboard and that was okay. That's why I say, based on my experience and putting it together and that kind of thing, just wait for whatever's coming for a workstation. I don't know what that is. It's fun to speculate, but uh, the workstation experience with boards like this, I mean, this is nicer than even the nicest Threadripper boards you can get. Really, seriously. I mean, this doesn't have an OLED screen, but I don't care about an OLED screen. You know what I like? I like having dual Intel 10 gig NICs. I mean, the Aquantia NIC is fine, but it ain't no Intel X550. Another key difference between server-ish and workstation-ish or desktop-ish motherboards is around the VRM. And it's not that one VRM implementation is dramatically better than another. It's a question of use case and airflow. So look at the VRM and the power delivery here. Two huge banks. Now the TDP of the Threadripper Pro and the new uh, Milan-based Epic CPUs, they're roughly equivalent. And also the Rome CPUs. I mean, you know, up to 280 watts TDP. That's nothing really new. That's why Epic Milan is basically drop-in compatible with Epic Rome across the board. But you can't help but look at it and see that there's a clear engineering difference between these two boards, a huge engineering difference. The difference is not one of overclocking or quality or anything like that because, hey, the WRX platform doesn't even support overclocking. It has to do with airflow. So server motherboards and server-ish motherboards are designed for really high airflow cases. They have a very small, modest heat sink compared to this. And that's because they're designed for, you know, those cases that we've taken a look at that have very high RPM fans. They're very loud. Now people don't want that on their desktop. So how do you deal with that? Well, big heat sinks. You're not getting a lot of airflow, but the airflow that you are getting, you can take better advantage of if you have more area to dissipate the heat. And that's what Asus has done on the WRX80. They've added two huge VRM areas on either side of the CPU to deliver that 280 watt up to TDP for the you know, Threadripper Pro CPUs that call for it. Whereas on server motherboards, if you're going to stuff this into a desktop tower case, that server motherboard had better be getting excellent airflow directly over the VRMs. You should be able to put your finger on the VRM and feel the airflow. That's what the engineering expectation was from the engineer that designed that motherboard to go into a rack mount case or other high airflow case. If you don't have that in your desktop machine, the VRM is gonna overheat, it's gonna shorten the lifetime of the motherboard, or your processor is gonna throttle, or both. So you really have to consider that if you're gonna go off script and try to build an epic workstation with a motherboard like that. Whereas this motherboard has been perfectly engineered for workstation use. So let's go hang out on the forum, especially if you're thinking about building a machine like this. Have you got a workload you wanna test on something like this? You think it might make a good video? Reach out, let's, uh, let's talk, let's put it together. I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out, and I'll see you in the level one forums.